controlled environments, future of the billion dollar indoor and vertical farm industry. Well, we got it wrong already. It's a trillion dollar industry and it's a multi-trillion dollar industry. And I'm gonna hopefully give you some understanding of numbers, facts, and figures so that you can know why. We are here on this big marble and we're all going in the same direction. When you look at it, there's no cultures, people, borders, nations. There's no division. We're all going the same place. We're all homo sapiens moving together. But why are we here? And I like this kind of cosmic perspective, this overview effect of our world. And I think numbers and systems are very important to understand. This is a temperature timeline of our Earth, and it goes from 800,000 years until current, and you see this change in the top right where the temperature stabilizes. We call that a Goldilocks effect or a greenhouse effect, which made conditions ripe for farming and agriculture. Why is this important? Because that's what moved us out of our hominid, hominin, uh, hunter-gatherer phase into a farming agriculture phase. It's been around for a long time and exactly it's been around for 12,000 years. It is the world's oldest and most successful economy. Many people have forgotten that and have not seen that. They don't realize that. We see food as just everyday and natural and no big deal, and we've given our authority and our right and our decision about food to other people. But I want you to know that the economies that we live in today, the economy we have today, it's not the oldest, it's not the best, it's pretty broken, but the agrarian society is how it all, how it all started. It was a precursor to the Industrial Revolution 12,000 years old, and it's important that you put that into perspective with a couple other numbers that I'm going to give you. So, adapting to climate change means ensuring food security, but there's some statistics we might not be well aware of. 75% of the world's diet is made up of 12 plant species and 5 animal species. If you look at the population of our planet today, the blue marble I showed you, that is not very diverse. And if you think about the future of where we're going to be, whether it's nine, nine and a half, or 10 billion people on this planet, these numbers don't jive. There is something wrong. And so I want to put pers into perspective with you how some of these numbers and things need to be looked at and how they relate to you as someone on this planet. So why do we need to act? Why do we need to transform our food system? Is because 800 million people are undernourished, suffering from hunger. More than 1.9 billion adults are overweight, of whom 600 million are obese. So in some cities, we have people starving to death, dying of starvation, and in that very same people, in that very same city, we have people who are overweight and obese, but still malnutrition because their caloric intake is very high, it's a lot, they eat a lot of things, but there's no nutrients, minerals, and vitamins in what they eat. Diarrhea diseases kill about 1.5 million children a year, and by 2050, meat consumption will increase to almost 73% compared to 2010. So these are some other numbers I want you to put into perspective of our world's population and, and uh, that we hear thrown around. Well, what is the food system? We're moving away from a siloed or linear lateral view of the world, and this food system is very complex made up of production, processing, packaging, transportation, ends up at waste and actually should continue over and over and over again. 
Last year, August 2nd, we had what was called Earth Overshoot Day. Basically, that's a day where we went beyond the resources available on our planet, finite resources, water and energy, and things to grow and produce food to live a long life. If we all lived like Americans, they say that we would need five planets worth of resources, but we only have one planet. On the very first slide, you saw that. So after August 2nd, we were living at a deficit. And this comes from yearly studies. This last release was in 2017, but it comes from data that's collected over time that came out in 2013. Per person, to live a long, ripe old age, we need 1.7 global hectares per person. But everybody on this planet all together, we're using 2.87 average global hectares per person. That means we're running at a deficit, a resource overshoot of 1.17 per person. And on a planet of finite resources, uh, that's very devastating. One interesting fact that, that people might know, not know, and it's increasing exponentially every day, is that we lose 23 hectares of land every single minute due to contamination of soil, drought, and flood. <clears throat> Here's another kind of a statistical thing, but it's called the Doomsday Clock. It was founded by the Atomic Society of Albert Einstein and some other great um, scientists. And Last year, they updated us, or actually this year, the latest update was two minutes to midnight. Because they added about five years ago climate change to the whole equation. So we live in a world that's growing exponentially around us. We have exponential growth with technology. We have exponential growth with population and many, many other things. But as humans, we're thinking linear and lateral. And so I want you to understand that with this exponential growing world and we have the doomsday clock and we have this earth overshoot day that the numbers or the exponential growth of humanity isn't keeping up with the movement and the exponential growth around us in the world. We are on a planet of finite resources and everything is increasing. So agriculture and food and beverage is a leading cause of global warming. Most people don't understand that it's not the oil, gas, and coal industry. They're on the list, lower down in the list, but the number one is our industry. We're all experts here, and I want you to really understand these numbers. So we have a great thing it's called the Planet Protection Plan or the Sustainable Development Goals. They're laid out very linear, all 17 of them. But this is not how we need to view them. This is a very siloed approach and very linear and lateral. But we really need to view them like a cake or a pie because all 17 of the United Nations SDG goals are intrinsically tied to food. And the bottom layer there is our finite resources of how we grow food. Here's another example. You've probably seen Maslow's hierarchy of needs. What's at the very bottom? Breathing, food, water, sex, right? Food. It's at the very bottom. It's the very basic of human needs. It's the most important job and thing that we need every single day. But we've given it the most worst position and, and importance ever in the time of history. Food is not important. We're not making it important. For 12,000 years, we're contaminating more soil. We have bigger food waste. We have bigger problems around this issue. And we've turned over our decisions to the top 10 food makers to decide how to produce food for us. We've taken it out of our hands, but it's the most important thing for humans. The food industry not only in the EU is the largest sector, it's in the trillions of euros. It employs more than 40%. I'm just talking about Europe because we're in Europe. And it's the least digitized industry in the world. And my friend Kimball Musk said food is bigger than the internet. And it is true because we just saw it's something that all of us need. 
So let's make these jobs, farmers, and food important. Let's not leave this up to someone else to do. What does this have to do with controlled environmental agriculture? Well, here's the sustainable development goals, and 11 of them are tied to food, but six I've focused on specifically, and I've come up with a circular economy approach to revolutionize the beverage and food industry and apply this to a 100% sustainable method. Um, the solution that I have and that I, I work is called the Anya Alojas Eco Center. It's a large scale, thousand plus hectare controlled environmental agriculture in Germany, in northern Germany. It's run by renewable energy, Tesla power pack, battery backup, ambient water harvesting, rainwater recycling. That's my solution. That's what I've done. But what I want to talk about with the controlled environmental agriculture is that how many vertical farms, how many greenhouses do you think there are in the world? How many controlled environmental agriculture is there? Or how many just say vertical farms are there? 1,200? Five or 600. For vertical farming, there's, there's 1,200 and growing every single day. For controlled environmental agriculture, there's less than 200. For greenhouses and vertical farming, we can get up into the thousands. But if you know the population of the world, is that enough? When we talk about food diversity, it's not. And those companies, those vertical farms and those controlled environmental agriculture, they are in places in the Western world. There's very few in places like Africa or India or Bangladesh. And so I'm just running so through some slides of what our center looks like and, and why it's called the Aloha Eco Center, Adaptive Lifestyle of Health and Sustainability. And it's an eco center because it's a system. It's based on one planet living, a circular economy approach, a closed system. And I speak at a lot of events. I speak with people like InFarm, Aero Farms, Sky Farms. Um, Marco's here. I speak with a lot of different people who are in this industry of controlled environmental agriculture or even greenhouse. I come from four generations of hydroponic farmers. So um, it's very important to put the numbers in perspective that it, we're not competing each, against each other. We could liter literally have 100,000, 500,000, 1 million vertical farms, controlled environmental agriculture, closed systems, nurseries in the world to feed the population of the world in the future. And so to bicker about who has the best system, the best innovation, how to do it the best, it's not right. And we need to understand those numbers and put them into perspective. And Albert Einstein, I've mentioned a couple times, he said it best. We cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. We need to change. And global food reform is the key because this is our, our world. Agriculture and the food and beverage industry is a leading major cause of human suffering, climate change. As I wrap it up, real quick, if you slow down or reduce your speed while driving on the highway in the wrong direction, you're only going slower in the wrong direction. So when I see annual reports of big companies or small companies that say we're reducing our carbon emissions by 40%, it doesn't mean a thing. That's like saying you're stabbing someone 40% slower or shooting someone with a 40% bullet slower. As John Kerry said it so elo eloquently this morning, um, it's like an insurance plan. We buy insurance for our house and our cars, right? But we're not buying it for our planet. We're not investing anything. We must stop and reverse our direction, figure out that the systems we've been using for 12,000 years are wrong, innovate, and move in the right direction because continuing this just does not work. And here's the top ways to do that. Globally reform food, 
empower women, empower girls, and rethink refrigerants. That's the way we can stop and reverse global warming. That's the way we can fix our food system because they are all tied together. Make an ego shift to an eco shift. And my famous last words is from Galileo, is we cannot teach people anything. We can only help them discover it within themselves. Thank you.